All right, we're going to review. Um, welcome to second semester teaching math. And so we're going to go back to the seven steps of the teaching progression. I'm going to use these. And obviously, it's been quite a while since we went over them. So I want you to remember them. Shall I see how much you remember? Maybe, maybe not. All right, so the first step when you are introducing a math concept and you're teaching a math class, and let's say I'm starting to teach fractions, what do I do first? First step, yes, terminology. So we're going to start with step one, terminology. What did we say about terminology? Yes, use it. So let's review this just a minute. Terminology, what is terminology? These are the words that you will use in your particular class and at your particular level. So terminology, the first step of the teaching progression is terminology. I want to remind you, I want you to remember to use it. This is defining the words that you will use in a particular class and at your particular level. Two things I want to remind you about terminology. Uh, the first thing is you have to deliberately plan and practice to do this. I'm still catching myself saying, okay, what's the answer? When I meant to say, what is the sum? Or when we're dealing with, I mentioned fractions, if we're dealing with finding the common denominator and then adjusting the numerator, I shouldn't just point at it and say, what goes here? I should say, what is the new numerator? So always work to, you have to deliberately plan and practice to do this. The second thing I want you to remember is that you need to enforce terminology use on your students. I guess enforce kind of sounds like a strong word, but um, a lot of times, back to the fraction illustration, um, your students, when we're dividing fractions, they may say, flip it over. No, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. We're not going to flip, well, we are flipping the fraction over, but we're not going to call it the flipped over fraction. We're going to call it the reciprocal. So, terminology, defining the, use, defining the words that you will use. So, these are the words that you will use in your particular class and at your level. And remember, this relates to the law of seven laws of teaching that you have to take. Or you don't take general teaching methods, do you? Okay, there's a, one of the seven laws of teaching is the law of language. Both the teacher and the students must have the same vocabulary. And this will be especially true um, the younger the students are, but even junior high students do not have a, a math vocabulary. All right, second step in the teaching progression. What do we do next? These aren't necessarily simultaneously, but what's the next thing we're gonna work on, Morgan? Facts. facts, what are facts? Facts are the information necessary to do math operations, such as the addition families, the subtraction families, multiplication tables, measurement, conversion facts, metric prefixes, things like that. And what do we want to remember about facts? Yes, automatic. automatic. We want to drill and work so that the students do not stumble and trip over their math facts as they're trying to do long division. So they're not making subtraction errors. So they're not making multiplication errors. All right, so facts. We want to strive to make our math facts automatic. Facts include the information necessary to do your basic math operations. A couple things to remember about drill. All right, drill is essential even in small classrooms or homeschooling. Drill is essential, even in small classrooms and for homeschooling. All right, many times we have students come into the academy that have been homeschooled, that transferring in and so forth. Where are they always weak in? The math facts. Simply because they haven't been drilled. 
And this would be a good practice, even if you have two students, even if those two students are your own children, to use flashcards, drill, help them become, the facts become automatic. All right, so the second thing, drill must be regular. So that means you do it a little every day and you do it all the time. It must be regular. It must be every day, every day, a little bit of time, getting those kind of subconsciously, getting them to know their math facts because you are doing it every day. Next step, step three in the teaching progression. Step three. I barely remember. Step three and four, sometimes we do them in different order. Is it procedure? That's four. Step three is concept. concept. Step four is procedure. And sometimes we might, depending on the level and the topic, we might present the procedure and get the students familiar with that math process or that math operation and then go back and show the concept because the concept will solidify the procedure. So concept, what did we say about concept? I'll give you the first word, success. Yes, yes, I want you to remember these things. Success in math is understanding. We wanna always strive to reach the student's understanding. So, I got an extra letter in there. So success is understanding. So what we want to do with concept is we want to solidify their understanding. What are concepts? Concepts are the principles, laws, theorems that govern how math procedures and processes are done. They're the principles, the laws, it's kind of the foundation that govern how math procedures and processes are done. Remember, concepts explain the why behind the how. So we're going to answer the question, why? Why do we have to have a common denominator? Why do we have to convert all of our units into the same unit when we're doing a story problem? Why do we have to, in algebra, only combine like terms? Why do we have to line up the decimal? We'll be doing des the decimal system in a lot more detail now for intermediate math because the decimal system is very important um, for fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, etc. And that's where we really start learning how to do decimal math. Why do I have to line up my decimal? Why do I have to have a common denominator? The answer is the law of addition. That's an example of a principle or a concept. The concept behind why I have to have a common denominator, the concept be behind why I can only add feet to feet, the concept behind why I have to line up my decimal and I have to add like places is the law of addition. What is the law of addition? And this is foundational to the whole operation of addition. You can only add like places quantities. So I cannot add fractions that are not in the same denomination or with the same denominator. I cannot add numbers that are in different places in my place value chart when I'm doing decimal math. I can't add unlike units. I cannot add variables together that are not like. Those are called like terms in algebra class. All right, I cannot add quantities unless they are in the same denomination. They have to, we can only add like quantities. That's an example of a concept. So then we will remember that when we're adding, we have to keep everything in a line so that my like places are lined up. We won't forget to get a common denominator when we are adding fractions. And we won't try to get a common denominator when we're multiplying fractions 
because that principle of adding likes applies only to addition, does not apply to multiplication. So we need to, um, concepts are the principles, laws, theorems that form the foundation of your procedures. They govern how math procedures and processes are done. Example is the law of addition. A couple of things to remember underneath concept. Concepts are essential for understanding because memorization of procedure is temporary. Remember we talked about memorization as being a poor learning technique and a poor teaching method. So we have to understand the concept. Why? Because memorizing procedure is temporary. It also leads to confusion and it's going to be forgotten. But you're not going to forget something that you thoroughly understand. All right, so concept Teaching the concept is necessary to understand the procedure and to remember the procedure and to be successful with the procedure. The second thing about concept. Concepts unify different math. Concepts unify different math procedures. I guess we could even put different in quotation marks because there are many, many parallels between adding, whether it's arithmetic, algebra, trigonometry, geometry. So concepts are going to unify different math procedures. All right, procedure. What do we want you to remember about procedure? Anybody remember? Yes. Okay, that is how. I forgot. Do you remember? One at a time, please. Think about yourself. Do you want to be bombarded with all these different procedures in one lesson? No. When you're teaching new procedure, remember, one at a time. Please. Don't overwhelm your students with too much procedure. So when we're doing procedure, we want to think one at a time. All right, um, let's keep going with that. Get my pages out of order here. Anyway, I don't want to try to remember off the top of my head. Here we go. Procedures. What are procedures? They're methods of doing the actual arithmetic process or problem. Procedures are the methods of doing the actual arithmetic process or problem. And as Rebecca said, this is the how. Concept teaches why we do certain steps and procedures, why we do them in that order and whatever. And then this is the how of how we're actually going to proceed through the problem, their procedures, how we're going to proceed through the problem, steps and so forth. So procedures, one at a time, please. They're the methods of doing the actual arithmetic process or problem. It answers the questions, how? All right, a couple of things under procedures for you to remember from first semester. Procedures are steps. Okay, so if procedures are steps, then the steps must work in all circumstances. So make sure your steps work in all circumstances. If they don't work in all circumstances, it means they're too specific to a particular example or to a particular type of problem. So your steps, make sure that your steps work in all cases. And then the second thing is what I've said earlier, don't overwhelm your students with too many different procedures 
or to many different steps. And let's add a third one, relating it back to this one. It's very important that you always relate your procedures to your concept. So let's add that to that. Always relate your procedures back to your concept. I mentioned sometimes we don't, this isn't necessarily sequential. So many times you might teach students how to do, how to find the common denominator and then go back and stress why they're finding the common denominator. All right, or you may teach it, the concept, work on the procedure for a while, go back to the concept and reinforce the concept. And so the procedures then are going to be understood by the concept and they're going to be remembered if they know the concept. So always go back and relate the concept to the procedures. Next step, number five. Okay, we've got our basics done. Now we're going to expansion. Remember, we're going to expand to harder problems. What do I want you to remember about expansion? Anybody remember? What do you think? Is it, it's easy? No, that's, the, that's story problems. They're my favorite. Remember story problems? What did we say about story problems? They're easy. What did we say about expansion? All right. Let me start it for you. You can do it. That's, is that it? So you were close, Morgan. You can do it. Finish. I will help you. You can do it. I will help you. Okay. A little bit of the power of positive thinking, but actually not so much that as the second part. I'm going to help you do this. I always tell the algebra students, this takes a lot of practice for you to be able, we're doing factoring. This takes a lot of practice for you to be able to do this quickly and accurately. And then I always add the little phrase, don't worry, I'll give you plenty of practice. Okay, so maybe we can put that up there. Don't worry, I'll give you plenty of practice. You will get this down. All right, so expansion. You can do it. I will help you. What is expansion? Expansion is when we add steps or procedures to problems or we use larger numbers with more digits. Not necessarily more steps and more procedure, but we, are, we could also use larger numbers with more digits. So expansion is when we add steps or procedures to our problems or use larger numbers with more digits in our problems. Um, maybe you're going to add more digits to your divisor. That makes the long division harder. Or more digits to your dividend. Or possibly you're going to add a procedure, such as you're doing fraction math and you're doing addition. You might add the procedure that not only do I have to add, then I have to change my improper fraction incorporated into my mixed number, or I might proceed from just adding fractions to adding mixed numbers. That's expansion. Um, okay, the next thing about this, this is where, two things about expansion, this is where concept is going to catch up with you. If you haven't related the concept and the procedure, you haven't gone back to the concept and make sure the students understand the concept, not just can rotely do the procedure because they memorize the steps. So the first thing about expansion is this is where not covering concept or not relating concept adequately will catch up with you. So what do you do about expansion? You're going to reinforce concept as you add 
procedures. Reinforce concept as you add procedures. This is where lack of understanding is going to catch up. Students are going to get bogged down and they're going to lose their place in multi-step problems if they don't understand concept. Number six, last thing, or not last thing, next thing, number six, problem areas. Yes, what did we say about problem areas? It kind of relates to what I just said. Yes, don't ignore them. The same thing I just said about um, expansion, that this is where your lack of teaching of concept is going to catch up with you. Same idea with problem areas. You can't ignore them or they're just going to keep coming back to haunt the students in particular. So don't ignore them. In math class, they, oh, do, whoops. Don't ignore them. Okay, they're going to come back and they're going to slap your students across the face. They're going to keep, it's going to keep coming up, keep coming up. Don't ignore them because guess what? They won't go away. All right, so problem areas. What are problem areas? Problem areas are situations where procedure or concept and or concept, where the procedure and or concept is new, difficult, or confusing. And guess what? The same problem areas occur year after year with different classes. Same thing comes up. So we want to head them off. So problem areas, you've got to head them off. You've got to address them. Don't ignore them. They won't go away. They'll only get bigger and students will only get more and more frustrated. Problem areas are situations where procedure and or concept is new, difficult, or confusing. All right, a couple of things about this. First of all, problem areas are reoccurring. What I just said, the same mistakes, the same areas that confuse this year's class is going to confuse next year's class and next year's class and next year's class. Okay, so these problem areas are reoccurring. Secondly, identify and attack problem areas specifically. When I identify a problem area, I take my red pen out and I put an asterisk by it in the textbook or I might circle the problem. So sometimes problem areas are problems that have these little quirks to them that you have to address. Or the other thing that happens with problem areas, when you're going through too many procedures too quickly, students will do the wrong steps with the wrong problem because the problems look similar or so forth. Even with terminology, uh, my high school students are constantly confusing the definition of real number with rational number. I don't know, is it because they both start with R? Or because they're both dealing with numbers? I don't know. They also continuously, especially in the junior high especially, confuse the inverse principles with the identity principle because they are related and they both start with I. So what do I do? I take steps to head off the confusion. I spend extra time drilling the two concepts or extra time practicing. And most important of all, I go back and make sure they understand why they're doing it. If they understand why they're getting a common denominator, like I said earlier, if they understand why they're getting a common denominator, they're not going to do it on a multiplication problem. Do students do it on a multiplication problem? Yes. You know, I've seen many times too. from college students that haven't been in arithmetic classes for a while in particular, I get this. If you were multiplying 3 fourths times 1 eighth, yes, then you do multiply numerator times numerator, denominator times, but is that how you add? 
This completely violates principle. Okay? Oh, many times, too, they'll even reduce it. Okay? So, a lot of times, especially, you know, we're going to be dealing with how to teach fractions a little bit more, how to teach um, decimals, how to teach division a little bit more so that you're aware of things that come up and you can head them off. Okay, so identify and attack. You've got to be aware ahead of time especially. It's much easier to be aware of them ahead of time than for you have to go back and correct, go back and correct, go back and correct. This is especially true at primary level. It's kind of funny if you accidentally do something or say something wrong, the students pick it up and then you have to go back and keep correcting it, correcting it, correcting it. So we want to be careful with that. So identify and attack problem areas. You want to nook, head them off before they occur instead of have to go back and correct things after they occur. Number seven, application. application requires a lot of thinking and it shows what their math skills are really like and that's why a lot of students don't like them. They're very concept dependent instead of procedure dependent. What do we say what did we say about application? Story problems are easy. They're easy. What about story problems? They're easy. Nobody believes me when I say that. Okay. What are application problems? These are using basic skills to solve actual problems. Or they're story problems. They're actual situations that could occur. They're story problems. We're using basic skills to solve real life, I guess maybe not actual, real life problems or lifelike problems. First of all, two things to remember. The first thing that you have to do is you have to proceed with the idea of understanding. So you want to strive to reach their understanding. So then the first thing you have to do is you have to employ techniques to get them to understand. And then secondly, make sure the students put the answer in context by using the appropriate units. Remember, if we're talking a story problem, they're almost likely going to have a unit, and they have to put the answer in context using the appropriate, using the appropriate unit. We'll be talking about application. On the next lecture, I'm going to go back and I'm going to update these to the intermediate level. Okay, so I thought it would be helpful if you knew what they were before we updated them. So what are the seven steps of the teaching progression? We begin with terminology. The law of language says that we have to use the same vocabulary. If the students don't understand what you're saying, they're going to miss part of what you're trying to teach. Then facts. We don't want our students tripping over their multiplication tables. Sometimes even in Algebra 1, some of my students are tripping over their multiplication tables when we have to factor problems. All right, then we're going to teach concepts and then also teach procedures, then we will spend a lot of time actually in intermediate, which is what we're going to talk about a lot in, this, in the next lecture. You're going to be spending a lot of time in intermediate math expanding some of the things they already learned, expanding their fraction knowledge, expanding their decimal knowledge in particular. And then you will teach new things like percents and some things with geometry that get a little bit um, upper level. All right, so those are the seven steps of the teaching progression. We are going to go through them in more detail, and we're going to actually apply them and change some things and talk about some steps in there that actually will um, be a little different when you're dealing with fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders, and eighth graders. Also, last semester we gave seven math 
teaching principles. The seven steps are steps that we employ as we are teaching lessons, in particular as we are going through a new chapter. What are some basic principles to keep in mind when you're teaching math at any level or any type? When you're teaching um, elementary. I'm just going to give these to you so that we can employ them and remember them. from first semester. There are seven of these as well. Seven teaching principles for elementary, or, and especially for arithmetic. Principle number one, we spent a lot of time on it, and we won't do as much of it in this class as we will in the primary class, but you're gonna remember these when I start. Drill on purpose for a purpose. Now, I'm not going to reteach this. I just want to remind you of them and make a few comments. Drill is essential. Remember, with drill we want our math facts to be automatic. But we also, there's, there's a balance. What should be your balance with drill? The balance is you're going to do it a lot and you're going to try to get these facts to be automatic, but they shouldn't be robots, and they shouldn't, you shouldn't be wasting their time. So your drill has to be on purpose for a purpose. You're not just going through the motions of saying times tables. That's not drill. So make sure that your drill is appropriate. Remember we talked about drill being appropriate. It's something that you have to do on purpose. It's not just getting up and having them stand up as drill is criticized because it's misused. Stand up and just go through this sing song and the brains aren't even engaged. So at least the facts are automatic, but you're wasting time. So drill on purpose for a purpose. And remember we talked about drill being appropriate. It needs to apply to the lesson. It needs to, appropriate to the, be appropriate to their level. You want to be pushing your students, and you can use drill to do this. You can also use drill to head off your problem areas. You can use drill to um, help students that are frustrated with their long division because they keep making dumb mistakes when they subtract. Why are they making dumb mistakes when they subtract? Why are they constantly seeing 15 minus 9 is Sometimes I've even seen this. 15 minus 9 is 6, right? Or a lot of times I'll see things that where they will do, instead of 6, they'll do 8. Or they'll, do, they'll go above the number and so forth. They're just, and I'll say something like, 15 minus 9 is not 7. Okay? And then the, whole, the problem's just as wrong when they don't know the procedure is when they don't know the facts. So drill on purpose for a purpose. A key word there would be appropriate. Okay, think of it being appropriate. It needs to be appropriate to the lesson, what you're teaching. It needs to be appropriate to the student's level. It needs to be appropriate to the student's needs. If your students don't need to drill the measurement facts because last year's teacher drilled it, drilled it, drilled it, drilled it, don't drill them that much or expand it. Do something else. And it also has to be appropriate in duration. Remember that. You don't drill for drill's sake alone. Oh, I should drill every day. And off the top of your head, you pick a times tables. That's not drilling on purpose for a purpose. Second principle, find the underlying principle and teach it. Remember, we're going to teach principles, not problems. We kind of addressed this with the concept and the steps. It does overlap, but I want you to remember to teach principles, not problems. We want to find the underlying principle that explains why the procedure is done that way, explains why the procedure works. So, trill, um, teach. 
teach principles, not problems. You are not supposed to be up there saying, okay, this is how you do this problem. Okay, this is how you do this problem. Is that how you teach math? No, we're going to teach principles, not problems. You might do that a little bit when you're expanding, but not when you are teaching. Okay, so teach principles, not problems. Remember, memorization is not learning. Okay? Memorization is not learning. It has its place, but it doesn't replace it. Uh, number three, always proceed from the known to the unknown or the familiar to the unfamiliar. We're going to proceed from the known to the unknown. We have to do what? Does anybody remember the word there? Drill, I want you to think appropriate. Proceeding from the known to the unknown, the familiar to the unfamiliar. We're gonna be forming associations. We're gonna be putting lessons in context. The word is tether. Remember, tether? We have to tether our new concept to concepts we already know and understand. We're gonna tether our procedures to the concept, and we can even tether them to other related procedures. This is an important part of teaching, tethering, putting problems in context. Principle number four was approach problems creatively. Here's what I want you to remember about that. Mistakes are opportunities for learning. Mistakes are opportunities for learning. Number five, keep students working, working, working. Principle number five, keep your students working, 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 working. What I want you to remember about this is that math requires lots and lots, years and years of what? Come on, guys, remember I told you? If you ever see me going up to the piano to play offertory, well, you won't. It'll be because it's recorded and I'm just pretending. Why not? It takes years and years of practice to play the piano. So math takes years and years and years of practice. So keep your students working, 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 working. Review, review, review. You have to put things in concept. And you have to continuously review your math. A good textbook, okay, if you took Bob Jones, everybody hates it. At the end of every section was the cumulative review. That's important. Last principle, number seven, effectively use all of your time. Use all of your time. Class time goes by extremely fast. Don't waste it. Effectively use all of your tools and all of your time. Whether we're talking, we're incorporating different tools and we are making good use of our time. Okay, we made it through the review. Friday, we are going to apply these specifically. And Friday, I want to go through and give you specific examples of, we're going to take those seven steps of the teaching progression that I reviewed at first, and we're going to bring them up to the intermediate level.